Like our martial arts, we like a mist. Yes, get fired up, everybody, because we are on the eve of the first UFC pay per view of the year. UFC back in Brazil for the first time in almost three years, and the first time in front of a live crowd in Brazil for an even longer time. The atmosphere is sure to be electric in Rio de Janeiro for UFC 283, where two world titles will be on the line and the big question after the most recent pay-per-view is will we actually have a light heavyweight champion by the end of the night we will find out for sure but welcome friends to the ufc 283 live preview show here on mafighting.com if you're watching with us live thank you for joining us if you're watching after the live stream or listening on the podcast network future mike thanks you as well but i am mike hack and joining me on this ride is the prince of positivity and my best friend, amongst many other things. And what a background you are about to see. Alexander K. Lee. Hello, AK. Look at oh, that setup. Amazing. I'm in the, yeah, listen, uh, out of you know, the uh, Amazonian jungle, the uh, Amazonist jungle in Brazil. I'm trying to match the beautiful background. It's, I've got plants here, the green plants. Uh, the green plant over here. You know, I'm a big, I'm a big plant guy. I know all the plant names, so. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to uh, happy to be here, Mike. First UFC pay-per-view event of 2023. I've already talked about it quite a bit on the morning, uh, the the official weigh-in show, but I'm ready to chat some more. Excellent. And my other best friend, my fellow New Englander, the Sultan of social media, Mr. Jose Youngs. How are you, my man? Uh, you like I choose one? to be. I choose to be referred to as the Czar of social media. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well fair enough whatever floats your boat i will remember that jotting it down right now so uh let's get into it gentlemen because we have two title fights glover to versus jamal hill for the vacant light heavyweight title is the main event flyweight champ davis of figueredo versus the interim champ brandon moreno part four unification bout in the co-main event rest of the main card pretty damn solid a lot of storylines in the prelims a ton of Brazilian representation on this return to Brazil. I think there's at least one local fighter in every single fight, and there's 17 total on the card, so the crowd is just going to be absolutely absolutely on fire. So, AK, all that said, let's do it. Gymnastic score, first pay-per-view of oh. the year. Where are we at? Oh, also, I, listen, I want to remind people, and I think the gymnastic score system was actually served well uh, last weekend, that gymnastic score is not just saying, oh, how good is a card on paper? That's not what that means. It means like, how good could the card potentially be in a best case scenario? If everything lands, if we get like, you know, some great highlights, you know, at least one fight of the night, like legitimate fight of the night worthy fight. We didn't get that last weekend. Uh, you know, compelling storylines in the main event, co-main, things like that. So it's not just saying like, oh, this is a great lineup of fights on paper. It's a nine out of 10. It's 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 looking at like the best case scenario and and, and how difficult it is to reach that best case scenario. So uh, in this case, I, I, I don't think we can go too high. Uh, a lot about this card feel, there's some great names in the main card and the undercard, a lot of potential for, again, exciting finishes, but also a lot of unknown properties. So for me to say, oh, you're definitely getting exciting finishes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's almost a guess or it's you're getting them because these are kind of like, you know, some of these are, are mismatches and we don't even realize it yet. So some potential for excitement, but 15 fights, it's a long haul. Uh, once we get to the main card, I think it'll be it'll be smooth sailing, but it is it is a lot of fights till we get there. So uh, but I'll, I'll say, you know, pay-per-view minimum should a UFC pay-per-view with two title fights should start at a nine. So let's say uh, nine point, let's say like 9.2, because you can have some really feel good moments here, uh, depending on who wins uh, which fights, especially given that this is the first card in Brazil in, in such a long time. All right. Uh, and Jose, this is an interesting one because both title fights are compelling. The UFC pretty much across the board always goes, and you tell us this all the time, with the higher weight class in the main event spot. And while Teixeira versus mm -hmm. Hill, intriguing matchup stylistically, and there is a lot on the line here, I feel to me, and you pro you might agree with this, I feel like most of the attention is on the co-main event of the night. The fighters, the history, fourth fight, through three fights, we still don't truly know who the better man is. Like, Do you feel the same way? Like, Even though Glover and Jamal Hill are on the top of the marquee, 
most of the focus, at least amongst the hardcores, is on Davis Figueredo and Brandon Moreno. Specifically the hardcores, I think we live in this echo chamber where that's where we consume so much MMA and probably people that watch this show uh, or listen to this show, their Twitter and Instagram is probably just littered with almost solely MMA. And I would bet more than half of that is just the UFC. So I'm assuming that this they're all excited for this because, again, this is history. This is the fourth fight between these two. Arguably the second and third greatest flyweights ever. I think you said it on uh, what like a uh, heck of a morning where it's going to be a bit before anyone can catch up to Demetrius Johnson, regardless of whether he's technically fighting at 135 or not. Um, but I think a lot, what a lot of people don't realize is the people on the headliner, on the big poster, especially for this card, fight fans are probably going to buy a pay-per-view regardless. Uh, so they don't necessarily have to go bananas in the main event all the time. Now, would I like them to? Can they do that? 100%. But if you talk to anyone from Brazil, like Guilherme, or I've talked with a lot of the Brazilian media, uh, especially because I'm out, I'm on site for a lot of these, and there's very few kind of like superstars. Like if you ask them who are the biggest names in Brazilian MMA, it's still Anderson, it's still Vitor, it's still Shogun, it's still Vanderlei, it's still Jose Aldo, it's still all these guys that are either not in the UFC or just retired completely from mixed martial arts. And there's a couple of there's a couple names that obviously are still in there, like Paulo Costa was the biggest deal in Brazilian MMA. And then he kind of faltered against Israel Adesanya. And then people in Brazil kind of look at him as kind of annoying now from what I've been told. But, and Charles is obviously a big name and then he just lost. But apparently, Glover Teixeira is still a very big deal in Brazil. He's kind of beloved because he's uh, kind of like this blue collar, like just go to work and put in it, put it in, never in a really a boring fight. And people really appreciate Glover in Brazil. And that's what is going to sell tickets is Glover to share at the top of this card. Because if you put Davis and Figueredo and Brent Moreno on a card, it'll probably sell just because it's the first time in Brazil in a long time. Like AK and I, AK and I have said in a few shows, like it does like the first time the U.S. the first time the U.S. goes to Canada since the pandemic doesn't matter who they put on the top of that card because people are going to go regardless because they really want MMA in Canada. Glover brings the names. He'll bring more eyeballs to the flyaway fight of the four names at the top of the card. I even in casual eyes, and I don't like that word casual. People that don't always watch MMA, I think Glover is going to be the most recognizable name considering he's, you know, fought on that Fight Island card. He fought John Jones. He's fought all these big names. I think it's a, the right choice to put Glover on the card. The better, the more interesting fight is the co-main, but I think Glover versus anybody in Brazil for a title, I think that's the right move for the top of a pay-per-view, especially put Glover in big words on the poster to sell tickets. Cannot disagree with that. And you make an interesting point. So I'll turn it over to you, AK, because when Yuri Prohashka got injured and vacated the title, Glover Teixeira had two things on his mind. One, I will step in and fight Jan Blachowicz for this vacant title in December. Didn't happen. They went with Magomed Ankalaya fighting Jan Blachowicz instead, went to a draw, and here we are getting ready for another pay-per-view. The other option is I'll fight Magomed Ankalaya in Brazil. And the UFC said no to both of those things. And now Glover gets to fight Jamal Hill, still in Brazil. And on paper, at least to me, this is a very, very good matchup for him, especially compared to Magomed Ankalaev. And yes, Jamal Hill is still dangerous, but this is a very good stylistic matchup for Glover Teixeira. Probably as good as he could get in this division right now. And then on the other side, you have Jamal Hill, first title opportunity. He's going on the road. He's been absolutely on fire. And while the stakes are high... This division is a bit of a mess, AK. So to me, I, I don't think he has a ton to lose here, but your thoughts on this main event a little over 24 hours away. I'm not crazy, right? Hill is uh, a slight favorite in this fight. Is this is that not? He is. Depending where you look, like a, a minus 135, one, minus 150, whoever, depending. Minus That's, 140 right now. Minus 140. Isn't that a bit strange? Because if this fight had been booked, let, let's say, again, this is a total, this what if doesn't make a lot of sense because there's all these other factors that would have gotten in the way of it. If if Glover Dejura's, uh first title defense for some reason hadn't been Yuri Prochka and had been Jamal Hill instead, uh, wouldn't Glover have been like a two to one favorite or something? I don't know. I don't know what's changed because he's because he's not the champion because we saw him lose to Yuri because he is a little bit older because um, Jamal has kind of put together, you know, a, a decent run. It's, it's 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 almost funny to me. And again, like you said, Mike, I 
it, n- no one here, no one who who has kept up with uh, Glover's career, with Jamal's career, with the light heavyweight division in general, would be surprised if Jamal Hill came out and just ran through Glover. It just, just, just you know, he's the younger guy, explosive knockout artist. Ha- ha- we've we've said many times has the tools to be a champion someday. I don't think any of us thought he would get a title shot so quickly. But every time we talk about Jamal Hill, it's about He's got the tools. He just needs the experience. He just needs the coaching. He's going to get there. Um, you know, he keep, keep, keep racking up these wins. He'll get that resume. And now that he's in there, of course, of course he can win a uh, win by, by a big knockout. But on paper, uh, like as we're talking about skill-wise and experience and big game experience, everything seems to lean towards Glover. And again, if this if this matchup had been made six months ago, I don't think anyone uh, – I mean, people would have picked, been, been picking Jamal. But I'm confident to share would have been a a reasonable favorite. So it is it is funny how the perspective has changed just because of um, what has happened in the last six months. What has happened with this becoming a title fight, a, a vacant title fight, with seeing to share lose kind of that five round fight to Yuri. Um, it, it's it, it, I, I'm not sure really where you know where this this newfound faith in Hill comes from. Um, I understand. Again, like I said, why why that knockout outcome is it is in the front of people's minds, but uh, but yeah, it, it is funny to me how um, how this main event kind of sprang up out of nowhere and it's become compelling in its own way, uh, and just you know it just shows you how quickly things can change, like our perceptions of fighters and our perceptions of certain matchups can change uh, in in such a short period of time. Because again, really, this main event came out of nowhere, this title fight came out of nowhere, and um, I think they've done they the promotion the fighters have done a decent job of of. Uh, building building up the anticipation for this one and, and as jose said um uh, man you really can't go wrong with with glover main eventing uh in brazil his first fight in his home country since i think uh, 2015 he said yeah because and, and jose i go back to you because glover gets what he wants here gets the headline at home and gets stylistically a better fight and gets the mm-hmm. home crowd behind him and that's all great he gets what he wants and in a weird way, I feel like this is about as good as it could be for Jamal Hill as well. He gets thrust into a title fight on short notice. I don't, honestly, I don't think he has a ton to lose here. I think it's, it's not house, like there's house money fights. And then there's like a step below a house money fight. And I think this is a step below a house money fight. Because if he wins, massive moment for him. He's the freaking champion doing it way sooner than people expected it. And if he loses, so what? You Go back to the drawing board. You win a fight or two, and you're right back in the mix. And this time, it's not a short notice. Hey, fly to Brazil, fight for the belt. It's a legit full training camp. Go fight for the belt. So, do you agree with that notion that while Glover gets what he wants, Jamal getting this fight on short notice in Brazil, the way it came together, it's about as close to a house money situation as it gets for a guy like this. Like, would you would you agree with that? I mean, I don't think it's especially for fights like this where you take it on short notice and I don't, I'm not using the term save a pay-per-view, but if you lose to Glover like this, you know, taking a fight that going into enemy territory, the UFC historically, you know, they appreciate guys that help them out. If Jamal Hill say loses to Glover, uh, I don't think it's going to hurt his stock too much considering kind of, like I said, it's kind of an echo chamber of mixed martial arts right now. You lose to someone that I think a lot of people would understand that he, he had a tall task ahead of him preparing for Anthony Smith getting his fight bumped up like a month or so and fighting Glover to share it and a guy who stylistically is kind of a nightmare for Jamal Hill. If he goes out there and then say they book him against the winner of Ryan Spann and Nikita Krilov and then he beats them, I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of threw Jamal Hill into another number one contender fight or another title shot considering, you know, everything's kind of working against him right now. So I don't always agree that well, I don't think there's a ton of pressure on Glover either. Maybe the age thing has something to do with it because there's only so few title shots you can have in your 40s uh so in that aspect i get it uh but it's kind of a tough situation for both men but i do agree with you if jamal hill loses it's not going to hurt his stock a ton if anything it's going to kind of bol- like kind of vault him up in the eyes of fans and more importantly the people in charge of matchmaking because they seem to really like putting jamal hill in, in headliners and then it'll only get big, big bots now that they helped him out with this one Yep, and it's a nice little learning lesson along the way. So, uh, AK, what's the biggest question you have in this fight? Is it a, is it a question on the Glover side, question on the Hill side? Where are we at here? Everyone who's seen me pick fights recently knows I'm, I'm always wondering about the age gap. Uh, Jose, I think you you told us on the weigh-in show this isn't this isn't the biggest. The biggest would have been Randy Couture no, and not even, Gabriel Gonzaga. It's not even 
it's not even the biggest for a Glover to share a title fight, if I remember right. correctly. Or how old is Jamal Hill? Uh, 31. Well, I, your Prohaska was like 29 or something when he fought Glover. So that would right. be an even bigger. That'd be even so bigger. The, Glover's last fight was a bigger gap. <laughs> <It> was already, <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's also something said. I think Jamal Hill feels younger than Yuri just because less mileage, right? He's only He hasn't That's been sure. as long. He's fought less. So, so in fight years, he's a bit younger in that sense. Um, and man, that's just such a, I, I see some people in the comments going like, like a uh, Glover's going to kill him. You know, he's going to, and of course, of course, Glover is, look, we all know he's the more skilled fighter. Uh, but MMA is so wonky, especially the, the, as you go up in weight, I think once you go up to 185 and then light heavyweight and heavyweight can be such a crapshoot light heavyweight. I mean, not as much as heavyweight. We all know heavyweight is, can be a total coin toss, especially depending on athleticism and age and things like that. Um, so I look, I fully believe again, Glover Teixeira is the better fighter and the better fighter should win. But this is MMA where like weird, dumb stuff happens all the time. So I really want to know, uh, Glover says, <laughs> I said at media day, I'm in my prime. He said, I'm in my prime, man. I mean, a lot of us had kind of joked about how funny it would be if, if, you know, they set up this fight for the vacant title. Glover wins, has this magical moment in his home country and then retires and then they vacate the title again. Doesn't sound like he plans to do that. Um, he definitely wants to get the Yuri fight again, and uh, obviously that's what he would want next if he um, if he becomes champion again. So uh, I, I don't know. He says in his prime, he looked great in the Yuri fight. We call that one of the best fights we've ever seen. He looked awesome in it. I don't think he's you know I don't think he's anywhere. He's close to like to slowing down yet, at least not to the point where Jamal Hill should be able to just as I said earlier like run through him, even though that's still a possibility. Um, but yes, the age thing, I, I just I just can't look past it. I mean, 43 is 43 is 43, and it's a hard 43 with some of the fights Glover's been in. And is he the same guy after that Yuri fight? Because we have seen careers change uh, after wars. I mean, I always say Chuck Liddell, Vanderlei Silva, neither man was ever the same after that fight. One of my favorite fights of all time. I think neither. I think it er erased both men's chins. I hope that's not the case with Glover. I hope that, as a lot of people seem to be saying, that just showed us how good he still is. Hope that's the case, but. but a lot of mileage there and uh jamal hill nothing to lose might just come out and, and rush and see what happens like you said earlier according to DraftKings, just took another look at it jamal hill the favorite at minus 140 the comeback on glover share plus 120. jose what's what's the pick who's leaving rio as the light heavyweight champ Uh, more than likely, Glover Teixeira for a lot of the things I said. Uh, specifically, his style of fighting seems to be a nightmare of Glover Teixeira. I think you said that on Heck of a Morning where, uh, you know, Tiago Santos is not the best wrestler in the world, and he took down Jamal Hill a lot in that fight. So chances are if Tiago Santos, who, according to John Jones, is a black belt in Muay Thai, which just doesn't exist, um, <laughs> If he can do it, chances are Glove to share can do it. And if Glove to share gets on top of you, he's a man that Daniel Cormier has said has an incredibly heavy top game. And that is an Olympic wrestling captain and former UFC champ champ. I'm going to take his word for it. He knows what he's talking about. So uh, I'm going to pick Glove to share. It is weird because I was like looking at Jamal Hill's like past few wins, and even going into this one. Everyone keeps talking about his touch of death and just knocking all these people out. His last three wins, he's fought guys coming off of losses. So I'm curious. He's fighting another guy coming off a loss in a very, you know, brutal loss in the sense it was a back and forth war. If Glover's body and chin hold up, Glover should win. Now, Jamal Hill hits very hard and he hits very accurate and he's very wild. He doesn't, you know, if you look at a professional fighter if you look at like i know like joe rogan always talks about like oh if you look at the silhouette of a fighter you can there's some fighters you can just tell who's fighting you can tell when jamal hill fights if you look at his silhouette because he's pretty wild and leaves himself open if he touches glover's chin i'm curious if it holds up but if if, if it does hold up i like i said it should be glover's to win aka i assume you're going with with glover to share here but yeah. Who knows? Maybe you're maybe you're playing the 2023 is just so chaotic. Let's keep the chaos train moving from station to station. Where are we at? Yeah, I can't. I just can't pick against him. He, he's he's the better fighter. He's a better grappler. Uh, honestly, technically speaking, he's probably still a better striker. I know we know Jamal Hill for his striking, but just given uh, you know who Glover has been there with, who he's gone the distance with, uh, Glover is a very 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 good striker. So I mean, while we all agree that um, obviously Jamal's best way to win this fight is to keep it on the feet. It's not like Glover is just like, oh, he has to take 
Jamal Hill down or he's toast. It's like, no, that's just the easiest path to victory for him. Uh, Glover's a more than competent striker. So I, I don't know what department, other than what I mentioned, youth, uh, you know, athleticism, reach, I don't know. Other than those physical gifts, uh, I don't know what department I would say Jamal Hill is superior to uh, than Glover. So I, I, if, I, if, if I, I'm not betting, even though uh, the UFC uh, has been reinstated with uh, betting sites and outlets in Ontario, I am not betting. But if I were and if I, if I had to, um, I, I lean with, with Glover to share. Let's go, let's go away from chaos. Normally I say chaos is a very safe bet when we're talking about MMA. Uh, and, let's, and again, Glover's last fight, maybe the most chaotic thing we've ever seen, chaos personified. Uh, let's hope he just has a pleasant homecoming this time around and uh, takes care of business in a way that I think a lot of people probably have been predicting since since the first day that this was matched up. You know, we see the jujitsu, we see that old man strength, uh, and we see him get a submission out of Jamal Hill, second or third round. Yeah, I mean, would would Hill winning surprise me? I mean, I, I'd be a little surprised. I would be a little surprised if Jamal Hill wins. Like, would I be shocked beyond belief? No, but just everything you guys both said, but to, to kind of take it all home, this to me, this is how I see it in my head right now. This has Glover Teixeira, Jan Bohovic vibes to it, where Glover takes him down, beats him up in the first round. Jamal Hill, you know, who knows? Like maybe Jamal Hill will stuff a takedown or something, maybe two. But eventually Glover's just going to tackle him and then he's just going to beat him up. Hill might survive and get to round two. And then I think the same thing's just going to happen again. Like Jamal Hill is going to realize I got to do something big here. Glover's just going to tackle him, get on top, beat him up, and then take the back or whatever and get a submission. That's how I see it play down. Again, I could be totally wrong. Jamal could just light him up with a big shot. Wouldn't be totally shocked if that happened. I'd be a little bit surprised if Jamal Hill wins this fight, but I just feel like everything lines up for Glover to share here. Uh, so two-time champ. That's what I'm predicting right now, but... We will see what happens. Now, the call made it. 63% gentlemen. in our poll, Mike. 63% picking Glover to share on our YouTube poll. 63%. Okay. Pretty pretty firm. Let's go Let's go to the call main event. We have Davis and Figueredo versus Brandon Moreno, the Tetralogy, ladies and gentlemen. Part four, what a story it has been. Jose, you have been in the building for all three of the fights that we have seen already. And for those who were newer fans, first fight, both guys – Jumping in on short notice to save a pay-per-view. They have an all-time classic, and they fight to a draw. And then part two, Brandon Moreno dominates, finishes Davis and Figueredo. It's a moment that gives me the most FOMO to this day that I couldn't have been in that arena to see it happen. It was an incredible moment for Brandon Moreno. The crowd went crazy. Unbelievable stuff. Part three, Figgy changes things up. He goes to fight ready with Eddie Cha and Henry Cejudo and company. He gets an unbelievable shape, makes a lot of tweaks, and he wins a very, very close decision to win the title back at UFC 270 around a year ago. And 12 months later, we are getting chapter four. So Jose, we talked a little bit about this on BTL, but again, you are in the building for all three of these first, first fights. When you hear about these two guys, this rivalry, the way the first three fights went, part four being in Brazil, finally in front of Figgy fans, the respect. Then it got to heat, and then it got a little cringy, but now it seems to be back to respect, and it's about the glory and the battle ahead. What has this rivalry meant to the promotion, the flyweight division, the sport, and, and to you personally being in the arena for all three of these fights? I mean... It's super unique in the sense that, A, is for a multitude of reasons. It's the fourth time we've ever had four fights between two guys. Every single fight has had a new wrinkle. Uh, like, I know you said I was in the building for all, all four, uh, for the first three. Uh, technically, I was not in the building for the first one because that was peak pandemic. So we had to sit out in a tent in the parking lot to watch that. So it just, it just adds this thing where all four of these fights have, you could basically measure how the pandemic went the first fight you know was in front of nobody the second fight was one of the i think second maybe third fights and it was still limited masks were still required the third fight southern california rules are pretty much lifted and then the fourth one right now in brazil uh going into a whole nother country it just every single one which obviously wasn't we weren't able to do for the longest time 
Uh, so every single fight just adds a wrinkle in terms of what is happening to the world, but it's also what is happening to this division. Because like I said, all three of the first three fights, I know it sort of held the division up, but I think it benefited the division greatly because we got a lot of, we got to see the rest of the division kind of fight each other. We had the emergence of new stars. We've had some people rise to the top. Some people kind of falter. Uh, but as the division has got exciting, we've seen these new matchups that we want to see, you know, Pantoja Figueredo too. We want to see Pantoja Moreno too. We want to see Mateus Nicolau versus one of these guys. We got want to see Almir Albaza. We want to see Muhammad Mahayev. We want to see all these guys fight each other. And now we finally get to see them fighting for these titles. Obviously, Henry Cejudo, as he said, saved the flyweight division. But when he left and he handed it off to like, let's figure this next out. A lot of people just thought Joe B would be the guy. You know, he fought Figueredo. The first one had that weird headbutt. Figueredo then also missed weight. Joe B and him flew to the first fight island, uh, first group of fight island cards. And then Figueredo made weight and then beat Joe B. And then it's like, okay, what do we have here now? Uh, do we Can we build this superstar? And then Davidson Figueredo, you know, beat Alex Perez uh, and then turned right around and made history as the first champ to headline two previews back-to-back -back fights, Brian Moreno to a draw and one of the best flyweight fights you'll ever see in front of nobody. This fight, that fight ruled. And it's one of those rare occasions where the rematch is not always going to live up to the expectations. Like we still like, I don't think people, a lot of people realize that Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin fought twice because the second fight was so unforgettable. Like every, every now and then, you get, you know, a Dan Henderson Shogun where the first fight is an all-time classic and the second fight, while not an all-time classic, was still fantastic because on the other side of the coin, you get Jones Gustafson 1 and then you saw what happened in Jones Gustafson 2. This fight, every single fight has delivered. It's all been one of the best fights. If you make a list of the top five, top six best flyaway fights, all three of their first fights are in that list. One of them might even be the top. So... Checks all the boxes, high-level martial arts, the two best in their division, probably the second and third greatest of all time in this weight class. It's in a country that is just starving for stars in MMA. I cannot speak more highly of these two gentlemen, and I'm very, very excited. I'll watch these guys fight 10 times. I truly don't care. Obviously, that's not fair to the division, but I'm very excited for this fourth fight. AK, this must mean a little something to you, too, because by the time the third fight rolled around... Davis and Figueredo's best weapon, AK, is something that you frown upon. He mixed the martial arts more oh. than maybe he ever has in his career, and it led to a victory. So we've seen it all here. We've seen like we've seen a brawl, an, an incredible fight the first time. Moreno just dump trucked him in the second fight. And then the third fight, we see Figgy just make all these changes. He mixed the martial arts beautifully, wins the fight, and now we go to Brazil and we get to do this again. So what have you made of, of, of this rivalry as we head into the fourth, per, perhaps the final chapter, but maybe not? Uh, listen, I'm with I'm with Jose. Let, let me see this five times, six times, seven. I want they have <laughs> not fought every 12 months. They fought, but they fought every calendar year. December 2020, June 2021, January 2022, now January 2023. I want a yearly Moreno Figueredo fight. It won't be good for their brains. Yes, not fair for the rest of the division. But like I said, titles don't even have to matter. Let's say a year from now, Figueredo's a bantam weight, Moreno's still a flyweight, have a meet at 130, catch weight, whatever, whatever weight is comfortable. I want these guys fighting once a year. It's just we just saw uh uh Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi have an exhibition game that the at PSG played, whatever the 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 Riyadh stars or something. Uh and that was on by the way, that was on pay-per-view, I think. I could be wrong, but I believe that was on pay-per-view on YouTube. And I think it did really good numbers. So I'm not saying, listen, I, I'm not saying Figueredo and Moreno are anywhere near that level of notoriety. I mean, they're not even main eventing this pay-per-view for God's sakes. But as far as flyweights go, these guys are the two best in the UFC. Again, in the world, you throw in, of course, Demetrius Johnson. But these are the two best guys. I All three of their fights have been fun to watch. I mean, the second fight was a little more one-sided, but was super exciting in its own way. Just seeing the way that Brandon Moreno peaked and did something that we thought would be impossible given that he was cut from the UFC a few years ago. So that was incredible. It's such an awesome trilogy, uh, uh, tetralogy now, excuse me, it will be a tetralogy when they step into the cage on, on Saturday. And I, I wish it was headlining. We've said all the good reasons why 
Uh, you know, the, the light heavyweight fight is in there. They usually go with the heavier fights. Clover Teixeira is a, just a beloved. He's got that fan base in, in Brazil. Uh, Figgy, you know, just hasn't been around as long, hasn't built that affection that that Glover has. Um, so it makes sense. I I, I totally understand. Um, and, you know, UFC has never pushed the flyweights in that way, saying that they are the main event of main events. It's only like when they've had to put flyweights in the main event that they've done so. But Man, it's just there's such a great history here, and I, and I almost wish the UFC over the past few years, not just ahead of this one fight, had done a better job building the division, done a better job building this rivalry. Because we'll, we'll, I don't think we'll ever see this again. I think we'll, I don't think we'll ever see four fights, uh, four championship fights in a row. Well, four, same opponent for Figgy, Moreno, 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 Moreno. I don't, that I think you'll definitely never see again in the UFC. One guy fighting the same guy four four fights in a row. At least Brandon Moreno broke it up with the Kai Car France fight. Um, and you'll never see, I don't know if you'll ever see such a quality trilogy where all three fights are compelling. The first and third are were just fantastic back and forth battles. And, and we could get that again on Saturday. So I love this feud so much. I don't want it to end. Mike, I don't want it to end. I know people rolled their eyes when when we we realized, you know, he beat Kai Kerr France and we realized, well, we're definitely headed to a fourth fight. Some people rolled their eyes. I said, listen, this is the natural order of things. When you When we're talking about a championship fight, I want to see the two best guys in that division on that roster. That's Moreno. That's Figgy. It's been that way for the last three years. I don't know if Saturday settles anything. I really don't. I feel like these guys could fight again 10, 20 times, and no guy would take more than a one or two win lead in the series. So if this is the end, you know, it's a, it's for me, it's a, it's a bittersweet goodbye because I, I am not ready to say goodbye to the, the Figgy Moreno rivalry, but I understand both men have many, many compelling fights ahead of them. That is true. So, Jose, I'm going to ask you a similar question that I asked to AK when it comes to the main event, because there's a lot more to unpack with this one, because Figgy hasn't fought since UFC 270. We ran down the history. Moreno goes on to knock out Kaikar France to win the interim title with, by the way, James Krause in his corner as his new head coach. And that is obviously no longer the case for Brandon Moreno due to the allegations and the investigations against Krause, the alleged gambling issue they have going on at the UFC that is just seems to be getting worse by the day, but a lot of changes, not a ton of time to make them. Once the edict came down that you can't train to Gloria May if you want to fight for the UFC. So are the big questions for you, Jose, about this fight on the Moreno side or the Figueredo side, because he did make weight. He seemed in good spirits, looked good but how many more of these can he do? You know, like where are the biggest questions coming from? Which side of the table? Uh, if I have to make a checklist of like, and like, you know, I have questions that I'm trying to place them on each side, more questions will probably be in the Moreno category in terms of the fight, because most of mine in terms of Figueredo had to do with getting to this car, you know, making weight, uh, the long off, uh, how would the build go? Like, you know, he's also changed managers. He's in his like third, different team and like I, we fought four times in his third different team so most of my questions will be actually be on the Moreno side for the Kraus thing uh training with safe Sayud, going to Brazil enemy territory because the first one was in Arizona and the the second one was in Arizona and the third one was in Southern California and there are a lot of brown people that go um and I know a lot of people are going to assume I'm going to pick Brand Moreno that's not the case I'm actually going to pick Davis and Figueredo I picked Brand Moreno the second time I picked Brandon Moreno the third time. I believe Davis and Figueredo the first time, and I'm actually gonna book book end it. I'm gonna pick Figueredo for this fourth one. I actually think if because pe that for as much as I love that first fight and as much as I, I chose that as one of my best fights of the year that year, it actually might even been my event of the year. Because I think on that undercard, I think Charles Oliveira beat Tony Ferguson. There was a whole Kevin Holland, I think, beat Jacare. That was a crazy card in a crazy time in my life. Um I think Figueroa won that fight. He just had, I believe, the point deduction, if I remember correctly, yeah. for the low blow. So if that didn't happen, we're probably not getting a fourth fight. Uh, obviously, Brian Moreno submitted him. You can't really dispute that in the second fight. And then the third fight, I did score for Devin, Davidson Figueroa. Moreno was walking forward, but I just think Davidson Figueroa was getting hit less and hitting Moreno more. That usually means you win. I think going to Brazil, I think Figueroa kind of, I'm not saying solve the case, but I think most kind of changes and coaches and all that will play a factor, not having James Krause, because I'm Mike, you've talked to Brian Moreno a million. How off does he bring up James Krause for basically saving his career without having that in his corner? I'm that's a huge question mark for me. So I'm going with the champion Davis and Figueredo and possibly his last flyweight fight ever. 
Yeah, Moreno built uh, a little bit of an all-star coaching staff. Got Safe Sayud at the helm and a bunch of other individuals been working out in Vegas. And here we go. So AK, Jose is going with Davis and Figueredo. The current betting line on the co-main event, part four, Brandon Moreno, the favorite at minus 125. The comeback on Figgy Smalls, plus 105. How does chapter four end, AK? Uh, I'll go to our poll now. Uh, Brandon Moreno, sixty-two percent, according to uh, the voters on YouTube. So they go about about a little a little less than the same amount of people who uh, think that uh, Tashera is going to win, but some some confidence there. And I'm leaning that way as well. Uh, again, skill wise, these guys are just so even. I, I don't know. Even um, Figueredo on at Media Day didn't really have anything to say about like what's going to be different. He's like, well, I'm going to go with the game plan I had uh, in the last fight, which I won, and do that, but better. And I mean, it's not an exciting answer, but yeah, I mean, isn't that all he can do is really just do what he did last time, but better. Um, and Brandon Moreno, if you ask him, it's like, well, I'm going to do what I did last time, but I'm going to do better than that. So I don't lose, you know? So uh, I, I don't know. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's impossible to really like break this one down too much from a technical standpoint and say like why either guy is, you know, has, has this particular edge. So I'm leaning towards Moreno because I just have trouble imagining either guy beating the other two times in a row like i really think they would trade off so even if let's say you don't think the first fight's a draw let's say it was figueredo wins the first fight by decision moreno wins by submission figueredo third fight by decision and now i think moreno fourth fight by decision so if if, if figueredo wins two fights in a row that'd be amazing what a way to to put a capper on uh, again what could be his last fight in the 125 pound division but i'm going with a little more elegant uh finish uh, elegant conclusion to this rivalry here where moreno gets the, becomes the undisputed champion goes on to defend it in the flyweight division figueredo can finally go up stress-free to the uh 135 pound division and knowing that listen he gave he gave all he had against brandon moreno no regrets um so yeah so both the main and co-main i'm, try I'm trying to create very simple storylines you know go over to share wins we get that year rematch brandon moreno wins flyweight division carries on this is mma uh, i have a feeling i've i've jinxed someone not that i believe in that sort of thing I'm going with Brandon Moreno here. It's just that this whole this whole series, this whole rivalry is kind of building to this because, like, I think he took Figgy's best shots in the first fight. Moreno obviously dominated the second one. I still think he won the third fight in the sort of 2022 version of Max Holloway versus Alexander Volkanovsky two, just underappreciated fight that didn't get enough credit. It's not exactly the same time frames, but I think the fact that that fight happened a year ago, happened at the beginning of the year, when it comes to voting season, it's not fresh in our minds. So I think people forget about that one, but that's one I would highly recommend you go back and watch. Don't even worry about the scoring. Just go watch the high level martial arts from both sides of the equation. Just an incredible fight that did not get enough credit. Um, I just feel like Moreno is continuing to get better evolving is getting all these different looks i mean just just look at the individuals and the coaches he's had the chance to work with during the series from kraus say what you will about him to now safe sayud his his team at entrom for all these years that got him to the dance figgy's still very good but we talk about father time just having a big time winning record especially in the lower weight classes at the end of the day this fight is going to rule so the winners are going to be us all of us who are going to be watching it but I am picking Moreno to get it done. I think he wins either a decision or he gets a late finish. And it's going to be like a Rocky Four moment where Moreno, who will be booed mercifully, mercilessly, that's the word I'm looking for, on the way to the octagon in Brazil. And in the end, he will be cheered and respected because of how great this fight was, how great this rivalry has been with Davis and Figueiredo. And I think we're going to have a very special moment in Brazil. Um, it just will be unfortunate for the Brazilian fans that figure it will not be the champion, but I think we will, uh, we will have a nice moment with Moreno celebrating Figgy, giving him a shine and then Figgy moving up to 135 to just have a bunch of absolute bangers. So we'll see what happens. It's just an absolute fantastic fight. Uh, Gilbert Burns, Neil Magny is the feature bout. Good fight. Jessica Andrade, Lauren Murphy, sneaky, good fight in my opinion. And then just the best, 2023 kind of main card opener for the first pay-per-view of the year. Paul Craig versus Johnny Walker. That has like 2023 written all over it where 
day to day, we don't know what's going to happen in this sport. And if we look at one fight in this car room, just like, I have no idea what's going to happen. This could be the greatest fight ever. This could be the most electric fight ever, or it could just be awful. That's kind of what Paul Craig, Johnny Walker is going to be. So I'm, I'm fascinated in just a very strange way about that fight. Uh, if you watch BTL yesterday, Jose laid it out beautifully. Uh, Shogun Hua is going to call it a career, taking on Ihor Pretoria. Uh, you can listen to Damn They Were Good, whole retrospective on the career of Shogun. Uh, and I highly recommend you go and listen to Jose talking about Shogun as well. What a career. I mean, just go back and watch his Pride stuff. Unbelievable. Lots of interesting stuff on the prelims as well. But AK, I want to turn it over to you real quick. What's the low-key storyline, the low-key banger? What are we looking at here before we go to the peeps? I mean, you just mentioned Shogun, and I don't want to say it's low key because I think we've we've talked about it quite a bit and written about it quite a bit. Uh, and I think it's even I think I'm even OK now. You know, I came to terms with it not being on the main card. I still think it might have made more sense than Paul. Like I would have flipped it with Paul Craig, Johnny Walker, because, hey, that would have been a great uh, fight to end the, um, you know, the, the free portion of the card. But at the same time, you look at it as this, uh, the four fight, the second set of prelims are on ABC on ESPN. Uh, it'll be what at seven thirty when the when the uh, the Shogun fight comes around. So he is retiring, you know, in prime time U.S. national television. That's a pretty big deal. That that is kind of cool. That is kind of cool for you know if there's some by people who who might not who might you know love the UFC might not and might remember the Pride days might not want to be shell out you know for for pay per views these days might be saving up for UFC two eighty five something like that. They still get to see Shogun fight. So. It, it, it's it's certainly not a low key story, but it just it can't be talked about enough. I mean, there was a time when him retiring, you know, could have been closer to being on top, and maybe there would have been more fanfare. Um, as it is, again, it is almost secondary to we are going to have a light heavyweight champion. Uh, hopefully, uh, after Saturday, we have a tetralogy, the first ever tetralogy. Again, one of the following one of the greatest three fight series we've seen, and you have a bunch of contenders fights on the main card, so the, the fights are relevant. Um, but to to downplay like what shogun has meant to like a whole generation of mma fans you know who are coming up in that that uh, early 2000s mid 2000s period uh like we can't make that mistake you know we say it time and time again mma is probably one of the worst uh, businesses when it comes to remembering history when it comes to honoring um our champions of the past our stars of the past and uh you know even though shogun is going in a, in a relatively uh, obscure fight against an opponent no, people aren't very familiar with just getting to see him perform one last time should be a big deal. Win or lose, you know, win, lose, or draw. Whether we, we see classic Shogun, classic, you know, Blitzkrieging Shogun, or whether we see like a more methodical, uh, older Shogun, it, it, it has to be appreciated. I think I think it's it's really going to set things off on the right note, like really send the card into the pay-per-view on the right note. The fans are, I mean, by that point, we'll have seen many fights, might be a little tired. Shogun walks out there. My goodness. I mean, you it, there will just be a roar. There'll be tears. Um I'm really excited to see the reaction, the live reaction. I think I think it'll be felt at home too. So, at least at the very least, regardless of opponent, glad that his retirement got to happen in Brazil because I think if it had happened uh, anywhere else except maybe Japan, uh, it would have been it, it would have been a little bit disappointing. So, uh, really excited for that that moment. I think Shogun fits into this category perfectly because when his career comes to a close on Saturday and we look back two three years down the road, he's going to be as low key as it gets. People are just he just. He's just never going to get the flowers that he probably deserves. But those who know, know, if that makes sense. But, I mean, just an incredible career. I've said this a million times. Jose said it a million times. Other people have as well. Just go back and watch his 2005. Just go back and watch those fights. Watch those performances. How vicious he was. How violent he was. And just how... And it just came out of nowhere. Like, it literally just came out of nowhere. And he just bulldozed everybody that he fought look at the names look at the finishes just incredible stuff uh what a career this guy had came into the ufc at 25 which is still such a mind-boggling number because i thought for sure he was like 31 or 32 when he got into the ufc so being in at 25 could not believe it and i just don't want him to be remembered just for his ufc career where he came in lays the egg against forrest griffin lays an even bigger egg against mark coleman then things start to come together he wins the belt after the kind of, I would probably call the first Shogun Machida fight a robbery, but then he came back and just melts Machida in the rematch. It 100% and, was. Yeah. And then four months later, 
he's got to deal with just the absolute terror that was the come up of John Jones. And it's just such an incredible run and an incredible career of ups and downs, but Pride never die. That's the, that was the best of Shogun. When he could stomp and throw soccer kicks, that's where Shogun was at his best. And he's one of the most unbeatable guys. If he could throw soccer kicks and stomps in the UFC at 25 up, who knows how long he would have been the champion. He was just so creative with that stuff. So, yeah, what a legend. We'll see him one last time. And, Jose, I got to I gotta give the UFC matchmaker some credit here because – you know, we saw Frankie Edgar, Chris Gutierrez in the books. We had kind of bad juju about that fight. When some some of these other retirement fight ha- fights happen, we see him on paper, we see the poster, like, ugh, got a kind of bad feeling about this one. And I think there was like maybe a couple seconds where he had a bad feeling about this one. But if you really break this one down, this is a winnable fight for Shogun. He could win this fight. This is, we could have a happy ending here. I think they did a nice job here. Yeah, this has all the makings of like when Shogun fought like Tyson Pedro or Gian Vellante or James Tahuna, where you have these young light heavyweights trying to make a name off of Shogun. And I know he beat Corey Anderson, but that was a weird split decision that a lot of people forget. Uh, But like you have these young up and coming light heavyweights that, you know, want to make a name off of Shogun like Anthony Smith did. Or I'm not calling Anthony Smith a young up and coming light heavyweight, but at the time his win over Shogun was really the one that pushed him into that upper echelon of light heavyweight division after making the jump up to middleweight. So you have guys like, you know, Gustafson and Anthony Smith and John Jones at the time when, you know, Leota Machida beat him in the UFC for uh, when he defended him. You have these young guys that beat the name like Shogun and you saw what happened to their careers. But then on the other side of the coin, you get the even I'll even throw Paul Craig into that name when when he beat him and Ovin St. Prue beat him twice. Then you have the guys like Tyson Pedro and Gian Vellante and Corey Anderson and James Tahuna, uh, Brandon Vera, if I remember correctly. Like these are guys that, oh, let's no one want like let's see let's test him against Shogun, and it just didn't work out for them to the point of like uh, Tyson Pedro took had to take a lot of time off uh, after losing to Shogun, who uh, same as uh, James Tahuna. So yeah, so I per I I don't I don't I hate the matchmaking in terms of name value but at the same time like i said on between the links like it's just so perfect that shogun is fighting a guy that no one really knows because that seems to be the type of fighter that they constantly give shogun and it doesn't seem like he ever turns down a fight so just sticking with the narrative of shogun down to fight anyone anytime anywhere i'm just happy it's in brazil japan would have been the only other uh, option like ak said and it's crazy to think about like I looked it up because like I'd, I'd always heard like oh he was like twenty something when he joined the UFC he joined the UFC in uh, two thousand and seven and he had only been fighting professionally for five years <laughs> when so he joined crazy. the UFC and he had eighteen fights in five years several of which were two in one day and like he was a dude he was a monster he still is a monster. Like Father Time caught up to that guy the same way Rory McDonald and Jordan Bean. Like they just started young. They had a bunch of fights early and then they got to the UFC. They had a ton of success, but eventually the body just can't take it anymore. It's just incredible. He and was never missed pro. weight and never missed weight. The pro's pro. A pro's pro. And he won at the time in 2005. Like I, I know the sport was kind of a baby at the time, but this pride Grand Prix that was going on, like winning that tournament was probably like the, the biggest thing that the biggest prize in the history of the sport at the time. And Shogun yeah. did this like three years into his pro career wins the Grand Prix and just trucks everybody along the way. It's frightening. Dude, he's so good. He's 23. It's- he was 23. It's insane. Him and Cyril, Cyril Ghan has the same amount of experience as yeah. Shogun did. That's even crazier to think about. Yeah, we could do another hour on Shogun Hua for sure. But all right, uh, let's go to the peeps. Let's bring Casey in and let's get the peeps involved. Take a few questions. Hi, guys. Apparently, this card starts at 530 Eastern tomorrow, which I was not Mm -hmm. aware of until like an hour ago. Is that earlier or later than normal? Earlier. That's later. That's earlier. Yeah, earlier, like a half hour earlier. Yeah, there's there's six billion fights on it. I wonder. You don't think they just uh, they better not do like a five thirty broadcast start and they're like, all right, your first fight coming up in twenty five minutes. I was like, uh. 
But you know what? The only reason I'll, I'll allow this is I'm assuming they're going to roll out like a 30 minute montage of Shogun violence sure. before. You know what? I bet that I heard so that's, I, my, I, that's my. I've heard people keep calling for like them to do like give. Remember when Anderson got the entrance, even though he wasn't fighting? So he got to like when I think it was for the Chad Mendes Aldo fight. Like, what if they did? Like, I hope they do that for Aldo. I know Aldo's kind of a name people don't want to bring up a lot in the moment, but in Rio, I hope he gets his entrance. Yeah. Be, yeah, Shogun better get like a championship entrance for his last fight. Yeah. I hope I, he, they better freaking from, show it in America. From, oh. oh, yeah. 100%. Now, now, I'm, now I'm getting upset. Just the thought that they could make it. So. <laughs> I mean, it's on ABC. <laughs> so you never know. All right. All right. All right. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, we didn't talk about this gentleman on the whole show. Oops. Uh, how does the Jailton Almeida fight go down? I mean, I mean, AK, I'll start with you. We'll go down the line because I'm sure we can have a lot of fun with this one. How does the Jailton Almeida Shamil Abdurrahima fight go down tomorrow? Listen, obviously, I want to say Jalton just runs through him, wins by submission. But Case and I were kind of talking about this earlier. And uh, if you look at the odds here, Almeida by decision plus 900. So, again, don't don't bet on, don't bet on MMA, as I would always tell people. But, I mean, Abdur Kimov, yeah, he's susceptible to being finished. But he's also far and away the toughest opponent that uh, Almeida has fought in the UFC yet. So... You know, there's some there's something to be said about experience. Now, again, I don't bet if I'm just picking and ignoring odds. Of course, I'm going to Almeida by I'm going to say ground and pound TKO. Just to, just takes him down, just shows off like why we have been saying he could be a champion at 205 or at heavyweight, uh, and just dominates a, a veteran in, in Abdurakimov, who you know again a little a little past his prime. He's got some mileage on him, a little past his prime, uh, dipped into his 40s now. So uh, I I am thinking a TKO finish for Almeida in round one or round two. But uh, if you're uh, feeling a little spicy and you think Abdera Kimov has a chance of hanging in there, DraftKings plus 900 Almeida by a decision. Do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't the encourage actual it. I don't encourage Almeida, it. Almeida minus 975. The comeback on Abdera Kimov is plus 675. That's a insane. Lot of money coming to if, you, if you look at Shamil's, you know, physical size and his last three opponents compared to Jailton Almeida. 31-pound like difference. 31 pound, 31 pound on the field. Who are his last three losses? Sergey Pavlovich, Dawkins, and Curtis Blades. Like, come on. <laughs> All those guys are massive heavyweights. And then he's got to fight Jailton Almeida. Like, physically massive is what I'm saying. And, like, like in terms of Sergey Pavlovich, Curtis Blades are very close to a title shot. How's it go down, Jose? I mean, I'll be weird and I'll pick Shamil. I don't really have any horse, horse in the race. <laughs> I mean, if he, I granted him, it, looking at those odds just kind of boggled my mind. So, F it. I'll go Shamil. I've been saying Jailton should go back. You know what? I am going to pick Shamil because I want Jailton I'm to go back to light heavyweight and make that division fun. So, that's my pick. Casey? Almeida by very heavyweighty, heavyweighty decision wow could be just, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying i think we're yeah gonna, i mean we're gonna get a bit of a reality check i made it i think is a, obviously a very good fighter very good prospect but is he a prospect how old is he no, he's like, he's he can't be a prospect. <laughs> yeah uh, that's like 19 prospect. fights yeah yeah, yeah. well yeah very, very yeah very loose term prospect i guess prospect in terms of name recognition amongst ufc fans but uh yeah um it's a it's a big jump up in competition, and for a guy that doesn't, I don't think fans know how tough the showman is. But if Almeida just steamrolls him, I might jump on the the, the Almeida train. I'm not there. Uh, yet. Yeah, agreed. I agree. I'm with Casey. If 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 Jelton smokes him, I'm right. fully right. on board the train. Right now, I'm trying to decide if I need the red line or the green line, and I'll go <laughs> hop on the red line. Jelton Almeida wins. Also. How many heavyweights have fought Derek Lewis past the third round in the UFC? Off the I was head. there. I was at that. Mike, you were at one of them. Shamil and who else? Volkov. Mark Hunt. No, five yep. rounds. Five, yeah. five rounds. 
He fought oh. he got he fought him in the fourth round. All the like Derek Lewis has fought to three rounds, so rarefied air, Shamil. Fourth round, Derek Lewis. <laughs> and Derek Lewis was losing every single round in that fight. He lost all three. One hundred percent. Oh yeah. I don't remember. Oh, this yeah. Was remember. Right in the this was in the heyday of Derek Lewis uh, has a bad back and is one punch away yeah. from being paralyzed. Era. <laughs> I just remember that fight as being just one of the weirdest. This is a main event. Like I didn't even know who Derek yeah. Lewis was fighting. I was like, I recognize that name. It was just it was in, in New York. It was New York, right? That was in, in Albany, Albany, New York. Albany, that was beautiful. The, so Albany. Not really New York. Yeah. That was the well, first UFC event. That was the first UFC event I ever covered. Was that card? Mm, and it was uh, the UFC. The yeah. one. <laughs> uh, the implied win probability for a line that high is ninety point seven percent for Jailton Almeida. So essentially, they're saying that if these guys fought ten times, Jailton Almeida would win nine of them. <sighs> Which I think I don't know. That's he a, could. That's a lot. Ca- of, Casey, lot you're of saying you're saying Almeida by decision, right? In, in a very heavyweighty fight yeah. heavyweight plus 900 heavyweight. Casey I know you don't bet I'm just saying plus 900 that's cra- that's really good odds for uh, uh made it by decision time to get rich you know it's not, rich. It's, yeah. it's, it's not it's not gambling if you know you're gonna win exactly 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 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh god um right. yeah I think Jose is gonna be jumping on the red line I th- that's my prediction all he'll right. be jumping on the red line okay what else we all got? Right, all right. uh I think this fight needs to be talked about a little more does Jessica Andrade versus Lauren Murphy have any stakes knowing that the title is on the line at UFC 285? Which, by the way, let me reiterate this. It is not 100% on the line at UFC 285. Shevchenko versus Grasso is probably going to happen. It's been agreed to, but we do not have a date set for that fight yet. Okay? Not done yet. But either way, Shevchenko and Grasso are probably going to fight each other. So, Jose, what are the stakes here? We have two women who both got finished by Valentina Shevchenko in the last couple of years. Andrade is kind of bouncing back and forth. Lauren Murphy's bounced back nicely from her loss to Shevchenko. Big opportunity here. What's on the line here? Is this just to kind of keep your place, or are there actual title, significant title stakes involved with this one? I think there's some title, title stakes on the line for Jessica Andrade because Dana White loves Jessica Andrade. Every time she fights... Dana White does this rare thing and actually promotes the fight in press conferences. So I'm going to say Jessica Andrade, uh, not that he doesn't like Lauren Murphy, but Lauren Murphy's coming off the win over Misha, which is a big win name wise, um, but didn't blow her out of the water. And then the whole camp thing. So I think if Jessica Andrade wins, I hope she goes to straw weight because I would like to see the rematch between Zhang Wiley and Jessica Andrade. I think those are the two best straw weights in the world right now. Um, considering look at Jessica Andrade's last win is against Lemos, right? And she's tapped her with a standing arm triangle, and the Lemos has looked great since. Um, the, the shorter path is probably, I mean, both, honestly. Strawway, just because she's lost to both, but I just think there's... <sighs> if they're really trying to make this Valentina versus Amanda fight for later in the year, the f- quickest path to the title shot is probably Strawway, if that makes sense. Yeah. What do you think, Casey? Uh, for Lauren Murphy, I think it's just holding her place, honestly, as far as a uh, a top five uh, flyweight. Um, I just, yeah, I just don't think the UFC is interested in giving her another title shot. Andrade, like I think Jose kind of said it, it, it. There's so many options for her, really, with with uh, strawweight and flyweight. I don't has Valentina has she is she going to is she going if she gets past Grasso? I mean, oh man, I don't know. It's so messy because if Grasso defeats I'm if gonna, Grasso defeats Shevchenko, I would think they would do a rematch. Hundred percent. Right? Yeah, yeah, they would do, do a rematch, which I don't like. But um, yeah, I'm, probably yeah, I, if I, if if Alexa Grasso beats Valentina, I can almost guarantee they try to do the rematch in Mexico. Sure. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I really I guess they're holding their place. I don't know, even for Andrade. Andrade yeah, it's yeah. Tough because both of them are yeah. yeah. So I don't are, think are, Valentina in the UFC is interested in doing Valentina rematches yet. No. no. That's the biggest sticking point here because both these women are more than worthy of fighting 
uh, uh, Valentina Shevchenko a second time. But, and we've said this over the last couple of years, the flyweight division has actually done a pretty good job of producing yeah. fresh contenders. We just said Grasso, Grasso getting a title shot. No one's complaining about it. You know, again, we know it's not locked in for that date yet. But when that news came out, a lot of people were kind of like, I mean, sure, maybe, you know, the best Shevchenko is going to kill her. But if you ask, I think most fans, has Grasso done enough to earn a title shot? I'm like, yeah, yeah, she's popular. She's winning fights. She's looked great since moving up she's to 125. Great. There you go. And then you have Aaron Blanchfield fighting Tyler Santos coming up. That's the key. If Tyler Santos beats Aaron Blanchfield, you're gonna re people are gonna want to see her fight Valentina again over everything else. So no matter what happens tonight, if it's between Tyler Santos or Lauren Murphy or Jessica Andrade, people want to see that Santos rematch. They really and, want to see her get another crack at Valentina. The, the biggest wild card in the group, Suarez. Tatiana Suarez yeah. coming up to one twenty five. Yeah, who had, and and we, we just, if, if Suarez, she stays there though. If she's 25, stays. you think what, she's going back to 50? Yeah, she's already said that she, her goal is to go back to Strawweight. This fight is uh, mostly the we'll feet wet again. I, mean, I missed that one. Or she does a massive yeah. weight cut. And uh, Manuel Fierro is still out there. Right? Manuel Fierro is kind of falling in the background now because of this fight coming yeah. up, because of Grasso getting the tele shot, because of the Santos Blanchfield matchup being made. But whenever she's ready to come back, she's right in there. She's right in that near that number one contender spot. So really tough for either woman, uh, either of these standouts on Saturday yeah. to like guarantee themselves a title shot. It just it's just not gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's just yeah, <laughs> unless weird injuries happen and just late notice type stuff. But otherwise, yeah, great fight, great fight, great fight. I yeah. think this, I think this fight could steal the show. Honestly, I I think it could steal I the like show. That idea. Jessica I like Andrade, Lauren Murphy. It's it's very possible. Like I I'm looking at the betting lines. Like if I'm betting on this fight, you have to bet on Lauren Murphy. You just have to. Plus three eighty. She's a dog. She's so durable, very hard to finish. Uh, she's going to be bigger. She's the, the strength. I think it's going to be pretty even. Maybe you can even make a case, a slight edge to Lauren Murphy. Cause I mean, she's been bulking up. She looks, I mean, she looks tremendous right now and she's just, she's just dog tough, man. Like Andr could Andrade go out there and truck her in the first round? Sure. Anything's possible. But if she can't, if this fight gets extended, I think, I think it's going to be a war. Like, I really do think it's going to be a war. So, uh, sneaky good fight. Sneaky good fight, in my opinion. All right. Do, mm -hmm. do, do. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm trying to get away from these if questions. Oh. Um. If Figgy versus Moreno, the best fight series in UFC history in terms of fight quality, is it better than, I mean, look, I, I know McGregor and Diaz fought twice, but I mean, those were compelling ass fights, both of them. Like even the first one, Connor having that big, that great first round, Nate coming back the way he did, like very compelling fight. And then the second fight was just insanity. Back and forth, crazy war. It seemed like we were going to get the first fight all over again, but Connor was able to hang on. Like, I don't know. Like, is this, Jose, you've been to a million fights. Is this the best fight series in mm -hmm. UFC history? If it's not, where do you rank it? In terms of fight quality, not ticket sales, just actual yeah. punching. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I'll go ahead and say I'll go hmm. ahead and say yes. Hmm, that is a good question. My gut says yes. Because there's obviously been like the the trilogy fight between Max and Volk were great, but that first that second fight was kind of a dud uh, in terms of like excitement. Uh, it was like bookended by two. Um, Usman and Colby was good, but that was only two fights. Um, I think a two fight Art, series would be on, better than a three fight series. Romero say Whitaker was Romero four, Whitaker was bananas. Fights. Romero Whitaker was bananas in both of those fights. I mean, it's hard not to hard to say no, but yeah. I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation, like, I'm struggling to think of one better in terms of right. three straight fights, all been in a, like, like, because, like I said, there have been some great trilogies, but they like there have been some you know duds somewhere yeah. in there. Because everyone like people talk about like Tito Ortiz, Ken Shamrock, but like some of those fights were terrible. <laughs> just I mean, one sided um, too. I mean, yeah. just beatings. Uh, Eric Prindle versus Tiago Santos. Tiago Big Monster Santos is my favorite uh, two fight series ever. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know, on Eric Prindle, this is back in the the earlier days of Bellator. Uh -oh. 
Uh, uh, Stipe in DC was isn't a bad one. I know that second fight, that third fight was weird, and the first fight yeah. was quick. Yeah, the eye, the eye pokes ruined the third fight for me. Yeah. It's just unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, sorry, sorry, I was like, for, for anyone who hasn't seen Eric Prindle and Tiago Santos, I don't know if this. <laughs> no, I, I, didn't get to finish, I didn't get to finish my thought here because because we don't talk about the series enough. Eric Prindle and Tiago Santos the met in the final game. of a Bellator heavyweight uh, tournament. Ends in a no. Con- their first fight ends in no contest. Tiago Santos groin axe kick right to the groin mm. on Prindle, who's like on his back, you know, you know, like come to my guard. Axe kick right to the groin, no contest. This show brought to you by Corn Nuts. Uh, 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 corn to <laughs> the, the core, core. whatever it was at the time. <laughs> this is legitimately how this is a real thing that happened. And then a year later, uh, Prindle gets his rematch, and of course, kicks big a big monster right between the leg, right in the nuts. Gets his revenge, gets disqualified, and loses the fight. But you know what? You know he was counting the days till that rematch happened. That to me is the the best series in MMA. So poetic. All right, all right. You win. We can't do better. <laughs> have Have any guys to Two fighters fought more minutes in a cage together. I'm, let's assume this. Well, even with the three fights, like it was a two 25 minute fights and then a two round. BJ and Maynard, BJ and Frankie, BJ and Frankie, that, Maynard and Frankie as well. Well, may, may, those that was a, those were two fights. No, there was three in the UFC. Five fights. There was no. They were all in the was? UFC. They were all in the UFC, weren't they? Yeah, they were mm-hmm. all in the UFC. I think there was only two. There was a draw, and then Frankie beat him. No, uh, Maynard beat him by decision the first time they fought. Uh, in a, in a oh, round. that's right. That's right. Like way before, way before the three rounds. Yeah, 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 way, way. Yeah, yeah. So I think they might be. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Mm-hmm. Um, Vulcan Holloway, <laughs> three five round fights. Oh, oh yeah. They, oh yeah, they went. Yeah, they, yeah. I forget. No yeah. one finishes Holloway yeah. except um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, maybe maybe so far. Oh, we might we might have a new record holder after Saturday night as far as most yeah. minutes together in the cage. All right. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> I think Doc Liddell and Tito they fought four times, didn't they? Yeah. Times? Oh yeah. I was at the, uh, I was we at, don't, I was, we I don't was count number four though. Oh, yeah. the, dude, the fourth one ruled. I was I there. Know. It was hard. Get the hell out of here, dude. I was in the arena. Well, that they fought arena. three times, right? It was three. That chuck, was chuck. Yeah, Cheeto. That was the third one. Yeah. yeah, it was three times. Oh, God. Don't put that negative energy of a fourth fight into the universe, Casey. Don't okay. you dare. Don't oh, you no, dare I, do I, it. I'm not saying I won a fourth fight, but I'm saying the build up to the third fight was actually the actual fight itself was, eh, but the build up was pretty fun, honestly. No. RIP Golden Boy MMA. <laughs> um. <laughs> Let's talk about, I think, one of the sillier things that happened today. Thoughts on Anthony Smith missing weight as the backup fighter for the light heavyweight title fight. I mean, am I crazy that I don't just care. don't give any exactly, Fs about yeah. this at all? Like, both both fighters in the main event made weight. If I'm Anthony Smith, I'm eating everything after the second guy makes it. Like, who cares? Like, who cares? He's not in the fight. Yeah. Both guys made it. They were two of the first guys on the scale. And then Anthony wanted to, you know, maybe crush a couple donuts or something and then had to just step on the scale. And he was probably like, damn it, I didn't want to step on the scale. Yeah, we've seen Anthony Smith weigh in a million times. He did not look like he was in any sort of, you know, fight shape. Yeah. Who cares? I, I forgot that he was the – I remembered Pantoja was the backup Same. for the flyweight fight. I totally forgot Anthony Smith was weighing in. His, he was talked about during media. It was talked about during this week too, and I completely forgot about it because he's training with Jamal Hill, and people were kind of like, oh, that's funny. He's training with Jamal Hill but might have to fight Jamal Hill if something like weird happens. Completely left my mind when we were doing the show this morning, and when I saw him step up, uh, Casey, you and I thought it was uh, it was uh, uh, Zara Farron. We, we were we were waiting for Zara Farron. <laughs> I the seen last her so one to weigh long. in. Maybe that was Zara yeah, we haven't seen her in two years. Like she looks good. She looks, she looks really good. Uh, it was Anthony Smith, and I wonder if he like if he like the rest of us may have just forgotten that he was supposed to weigh in because that was way over. Uh, most importantly, though, uh, Axel Adams, who asked this question, this opens the door. Now that there is no official backup for the main event, God forbid something happens to Clover Teixeira or Jamal Hill. But what so if good. they need one of the other? Yes, one of the other so men. Good. All the other light heavyweights also weighed in two hundred five on the dot. They're all eligible, and the first name I'm picking from that crop is Shogun Hua. So I'm just saying. Jose always wow. says, listen, nothing is official until two men step into the cage. So, hey, great. Glover made the weight. Jamal Hill made the weight. We are we are 
books. That fight is coming. Did but he weigh two hundred five or less? Yep. Yep. All the all the other light heavyweights weigh two hundred five. Oh, Puerto, Puerto, okay. Puerto Rio, yeah. uh, Paul Craig, Johnny Walker. They're all two hundred five. They're all eligible. I think. I, oh, I don't Shogun. know how these work, but Shogun by a wise, billion. Yeah, but Shogun by please. a billion. We're not picking anybody yeah, else. It's no Shogun. <laughs> Put Shogun. We are we are this close to Shogun possibly winning the UFC light heavyweight title in his last fight. For, for, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> And, and, and let's wow. keep it on Shogun here. Let's keep it on Shogun here. Favorite Shogun who a memory. Casey, I'll start with you. Uh, honestly, my favorite memory of him is just him in the as a general memory. Him when he when before the fighter uniforms kicked in. I just loved him wearing those little tidy whitey uh, bad boy yeah. uh, <laughs> Valley Tudo shorts. They just because. Because Shogun is essentially a chubby middleweight. He was, that's why he ne- we talked about he never missed weight because yeah. he, he was a chubby middleweight. And he, the fact that we saw this just ruthless, violent, just head-stomping machine, and he had little love handles. I just thought it was so cute. So um, that's my Shogun, who, uh, my favorite Shogun who, who memory. The fact that he – honestly, he didn't look the part. I, I think that's what kind of – I mean, he acted the part. I mean, he, I mean we fought – but if you just saw him walking around, like he doesn't look like this monster guy, like say like John Jones or you know Joe Tom Maida. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't look good coming off the bus. He just looks like kind of a in shape, you know, guy. But yeah, I just love it. And also, and obviously, um, my favorite my, as far as favorite memories was um, just him doing crazy soccer kicks and pride, just finishing fights like that. Just him, him seeing him, just seeing him in a ring. Uh, maybe this was it the second Little Nog fight or the third? Uh, they fought three times, right? Him and Little Nog, mm-hmm. yeah, one yeah. of them, yeah. First, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I and now these, I, these are before my time as far as being an MMA fan, but going back and watching uh, the Shogun, the, his big walkouts and everything, and Pride, and yeah, just just the Pride era Shogun that was that was all that, all, everything from that era. <laughs> The first little log fight is, is that ridiculous. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I, can't, I can't remember the first or second one, but yeah, it's the first so one, ridiculous. Well, the second one was UFC one night. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. First one is just absolutely insane, just uh, and that's the fight after the rampage win where he just. I mean, I there have been few times where I'm just like I'm watching fights and I'm just like I understand what these people are doing, like they know the risks. But there's only like a couple times where I'm just like, oh man, I really feel bad for the guy that is taking the beating right now. Rampage that night was probably at the top of the list because he just got got Molly and the, Molly. but he was just so tough that the fight didn't get stopped until like almost five minutes into this thing. And Shogun just, I mean, it was just. It was the stop, the, the the kicks, the stomps, everything about it, and somehow Rampage is like at certain points he's yelling at his corner something, and Boss Rutin's on the call being like, "Oh, he broke his ribs," and the referee's like, "Okay," and he just keeps kicking him like in the ribs, in the body, in the face while he's on the ground, and the fight just keeps going on. I'm just like, this is brutal to watch, and then finally it gets stopped. Give up, give yeah. up, give up. It's <laughs> yeah. I mean that fight. That fight is insane. I, I the Ricardo Rona win was a crowning moment for him, obviously, but the Rampage win probably stands out a little bit more to me because it's just so vicious. Like that just paints the picture mm-hmm. of Prime Pride Shogun, which again he was twenty three at the time, and it's, he enters the UFC at twenty five. It's like he had two different careers, and I thought he was like six years older when he got in the UFC. And what's crazier is everyone sees like, oh, Shogun first round TKO and Pride. Some of those first round knockouts were at the nine minute mark because yeah. they're ten <laughs> minute around. Forget they were ten minute first round, right? Yeah. So like, if you go look, they're like, what? Like he beat Overeem at like the six seventeen mark. Like what even? Is- he beat Gono at like nine oh six. Like what are these numbers? <laughs> So it's just it's bananas. How MMA should be ten minute opening round. Wow. Yeah, I would love that. I would love the that. best Shogun memory I have is him openly laughing at Conor McGregor doing his funny pose that <laughs> wasn't supposed to be funny. At the bot, the first FS1 card was in Boston. And I covered it, and they're waiting for the face offs at I can It's at that theater in Chinatown, uh, Mike. I can't remember the name of it, but 
like it's obviously Connor w- faces off with Max first, uh, and then all the, you see sh- he he's like standing there with like his I call it invisible lat syndrome where his arms are just like this and Shogun's <laughs> like what is he doing and just like laughing at him he's like in the background just like pointing and laughing at Conor McGregor. Okay, this is weird. AK, what's your favorite Shogun who a memory and why is it the skateboard? <laughs> don't we don't talk about the skate that skateboard do we know that that skateboard is not at the venue is not at jeunesse yeah. arena because i'm af- i'm afraid it's just going to wheel its way in <laughs> and just take if not shogun take someone else out i don't know that thing's a friggin menace but uh oh, at least it wasn't there the, the skateboard it wasn't there in the osp rematch at least you know i mean he didn't win that fight, <laughs> but at least he wasn't knocked out um i uh I, like Casey, I was a late bloomer. Like I, I, I watched like UFC, you know, mid two thousands later uh, UFC first before everyone, you know, realizing the importance of pride and going back and boning up in pride and really understanding it. So, going from UFC, which, which I mean, listen, there was great fights at the time too, but then and then watching Pride looked insane. I was like, I was like, why is he stomping him? Like that's no, you can't, <laughs> no, like that's you can't do that. What he kicked the guy's he's kicked him. Like he can't, what? You can't do that. You can't kick a guy when he's on his hands and knees. And sure enough, I mean, you watch those old fights. They're so vicious. And it's just understood and accepted that that is how you are allowed to fight. Uh, so it's a whole other world, man. I, I was just looking at, um, what was I just watching? Uh, kind of, uh, what's this guy's name? One of his stomp finishes, uh, Kanahara. And like, oh, yeah. it's, it's so it's how people I, I almost feel like it's how people would talk about like how we talk about slap fighting now i almost feel like if people saw stomps and mma they'd be like no no how can you allow how can you allow that you can't defend against that i mean it's a it's a different thing but going from the ufc that i was just learning about like as i was getting into it and then suddenly throwing myself into pride was so bizarre and so insane and, and shogun highlights obviously are a massive part of that like you just cannot think when you say the word when you say pride fighting championships him, Vanderlei, Fedor, guys like that immediately jump into your mind. Those highlights are so the, the Fedor suplex, just so many things. And uh, but Shogun, almost first and foremost, I think, in, in a lot of people's minds. You know, one thing I really appreciate of Pride um, and Shogun's victories is that once the fight was over, they didn't like need to go to the judges or commercial break. Once the fight was over, knock him out. The, the ref immediately raises his hand. And they do winner, you know, knockout. Like there wasn't this big, you know, let's bring the doctor in. Nope, let's just go straight to it. And it just, it just kept that energy. And it just, there was just, I'm sure, AK, you got that feeling when you first started watching those pride tapes. Just like, it, it was just, it was just everything felt different. It just felt different, even though we were literally watching the same thing. I miss, supposedly, yeah. The yeah. I thing. miss, I, cause, and then there was no stupid 10 nines. I dude, I miss when they like when like when Mark Hunt fought Vanderlei and they just stood there and they're like judge one and then just went Hunto and I was just like oh, he, 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 he. and then Mark Hunt gets his hand raised I'm like great like he thinks he would he thinks he would he thinks he would. there's all these stupid rules and uh, like scoring I miss this I miss yeah. that so uh, much I love, yeah, I love judge one Hunto <laughs> yeah I love it I miss that so much I, I miss. I miss the eleven foot tall trophies that were always yeah. like, oh, yeah. bigger so than the I actual. Miss that everyone, everyone in every fight, if you won, got a trophy, no matter if it was for a championship or not. Or flowers, sometimes they give them flowers. Oh before yeah, before the match you started, like you, get, you get a banquet of flowers. Dude, I love, flowers. love it. <laughs> it's the best. Uh, okay, now now we're getting just pride now. All right, all right. Dude, I'm here for it. I miss pride. All right. Um, just real quick, that's just, I just I think amazing hair, Jose. What do you mean? The only thing wrong with that sentence is it says today. Okay. <laughs> your hair looks amazing on, you know, every day. Yeah. Just Jose, your hair looks amazing, period. <laughs> Where's mine? Thank you, Garrett. <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's um, right. I just cut right. it yesterday. <laughs> um do 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 uh you guys did low key banger, right? Uh yeah, well, not storyline. Really. I mean you we like talked about Joe Grant stuff. I'm excited it, for Greg yeah. Cop so much. I love that dude. Greg? 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 Oh, Greg's back? Yes, Greg is back. Yeah. Greg Greg Rodriguez. Greg Cop. <laughs> uh yeah, that's gonna be a crazy fight. What's the uh what what is it for you, AK? What's the 
What's the low key banger? There's a lot of good. I'm excited about some of these. I'm even excited about the the the, the B side to uh, to Greg Cobb. Uh, uh, Bruno Fanetta. Like I I I know he's yeah. the underdog, uh, <laughs> but he's got some. What what I'm not looking at the screen. What did I? Oh, okay. Uh, he's got some. Uh, he's got a history of uh, of finishes as well. Uh, some of the guys coming in. I I Terrence McKinney is just so fun to watch, and and uh, Ismail Bonfim is also is gonna. If you want to see a finish, this fight's definitely going to end with someone getting put away. Probably Ismail right. Bonfim. But uh, but that is that is uh, sort of enjoyable and a real sleeper. You know, Worley Alves isn't known for like having usually having like fight of the night wars, but Nicholas Dalby is, and I think Dalby can drag him into one. So I think that will be. I'm looking at the early part of the card. I think you know you're going to get some solid fights. Uh, Luan Lacerda, Cody Simon. I think Josie Nunez is going to smoke Zara Fair, and it's going to be amazing and hilarious. But I think the first fight, that first back and forth fight we see in the card that really gets people like excited, I think it could be Worley Alves and Nicholas Dalby. So that might be mm -hmm. uh, when the card starts proper and then sort of the, the stars start rolling out and then uh, we build up to that. Minimum. It's, it's a nice looking card. Yeah. I hope I hope Greg Cop wins so he can get his Twitter verified. He keeps tweeting about that. <laughs> right. Please, Elon, come on. Casey, I also, I, I, I have no idea if Greg Cop runs his own Twitter. But I hope he does because he uses emojis so much and too many. <laughs> and I just really because like instead he's a guy that like he got nominated for like comeback of the year uh, for one of his fights by like the official UFC social account. And his response was quote tweeting it with like seven screaming emojis like like the shocked like the hands on the face emoji. I'm like, there's no way that was him. But I really hope it is. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, McKinney. Um, it's I, yeah. I don't I I know nothing. Who, I, who's his opponent? I know nothing about him. It's one of one of two brothers who won contender series contracts and, oh, are, com okay. and are competing so, on, on. So this Saturday. is his yeah. UFC debut. Yes, so, yes it is. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, which I think is kind of weird for. I thought McKinney would getting. Is he's, he's coming off victories, right? He's not, or is this? He won. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. They're, oh. they're, they're kind of, he only got the Drew Dober fight because he took that on short notice. So short they're kind of like, want to not, I don't say take things slow, but you know, just let him cook, let him put together that highlight reel. And we'll, we'll see if that happens again on Saturday. I think that's yeah. the plan as yeah. they, they expect it to be someone who will be Mel is really good too. <laughs> he's so talented. Is he? I, I just know, no, no, don't know anything about it. Yeah. Him, so, he's uh, like, he's, he's one of those guys that had a, he started like one and two in his career and then has just won like 16 straight or something like that. Yeah. His last loss, Casey, was in 2014 to Hinato Moicano. Uh, yeah. He's uh, he's a guy that, jungle. like, like if you look at, like, Brazilian prospects, he was always, like, one of the guys. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yo, well, I'm interested yeah. in that fight. I mean, I'm, I I just didn't know anything about his opponent. So, yeah. I think what's important is, like, because he has all these wins, but he, he's, he has a lot of wins in LFA and jungle fight and shoot to so like they're those are reputable promotions but he has a a lot of stoppage win a lot of stoppage wins but he has a lot of decision wins too so he's not a prospect Recently, that we're like oh how's his gas tank like his last three four fights have all been like pretty good decision wins so i think he's a pretty complete fighter casey did you see this question from pro fights info that just came in about the uh how many finishes uh, no, 15. Uh, oh, sorry, he's doing a bunch of questions. Oh, 15 yeah. flights. Yeah, over under seven and a half finishes. Hmm. I'm, going, I'm going under. I got to go top to bottom here. Let me just think real quick. I'm just thinking. We'll go under. I think there's going to be a bunch. Uh, let me see. One. I wouldn't be two, surprised if there's not three, a single stoppage in the whole, in, in the whole main card. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I could. Well, seven. Eight, nine. Wow, I have a lot. Ten. I'm going over. I think I'm going over. I'm going over. I have eleven finishes. Eleven. Mike, you're com you're comfortably over. <laughs> you're comfortable. I have I'm going eleven like and four four out of the five main card fights. I have finishes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because I I'm it going. I think very, it has been a very good stretch of UFC pay per view main cards lately. Mm -hmm. Going back to, I want to say. September, maybe August, if you want to include that one. So we're due. So we're due for a bad card. All right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Because I think at main card. I think, I, think Glo I think Glover. <laughs> I think Gilbert. I think just Gondraj. I'm picking all those. It's is this the first UFC card where they jacked up the price too? 
Oh. Yes. All right. It's, yeah. Yay. Enjoy it, fans. Yeah, I'm, go- I'm going over. I think I think the line may not be in the right place. I don't know. I'm going over. Real quick, because we got zero questions. I didn't see one question on it. And I, I don't even know if we even talked about it. But Gilbert Burns, no Magni. Did we even – did you guys even no. say the names? We skimmed over nope. it. We were talking about the isn't main that card. Cr- isn't that kind of cr- crazy? I don't mean – I don't know. It's just no storyline. Like what – what, there's just nothing, nothing to talk about. I don't know. It's a great matchup. Uh, yeah. Gilbert Burns is, you know, not far away from getting another title shot, especially if Leon beats uh, if Leon beats Usman in the rematch. I think Burns, if he beats Magni, pretty clear choice. I mean, again, Masvidal's out there, uh, Colby Covington's out there, but I mean, Burns would have just by having fought more recently than both those guys. I think would I would like to think would move to the front of the line. Magni. Yeah. Already owns the record for the most UFC wins by a welterweight. He'd extend that record. So that's kind of fun. Though, though when he, he broke the record, it wasn't like that many people kind of cared about. I think because he got there so gradually, you know, it wasn't like he And was like most right decision there, wins, regardless of weight class. Mm-hmm. Very, you know, and someone, something. Someone we, has to have that record. Yeah. Hey, it's not a bad yeah. record. If you can grind Future out wins. UFC I mean, Hall of Famer. Well, let's we talk about that. No Mag- you really think Yo Mag is a future UFC Hall of Famer? I do. Yeah, it's it's the Dana White Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. Does Dana White like Does Dana White like you? Yeah. So there you go. And 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 Matt Magny, I mean, deserves it. He has the accomplishments, but also Dana White likes him. I think so. That would that would be a weird one. I mean, we're gonna get there. Like you remember how how many how many years have they done the Hall of Fame now? Uh, Not that many. Yeah, ten compared to like your you know the the the, like your your mainstream national sports Hall of Fames like baseball, basketball, you know the major ones. Ten is nothing. 10 is, 10 is where you're still like, you're still like, oh, I'm picking like only the cream. Well, I shouldn't say the cream of the crop. There's some names in there where a lot of people would be like, oh, that person, you know, someone sells a Hall of Famer. Plus, they have the fights wing, which makes yeah. you a Hall of Famer. Technically. I, I'm, I'm talking just the individual itself, not individual. Fight, yeah. He'll get in there eventually, I think, but the, the bar will have to be a bit lower, but he's not going to retire for another like 10 years anyway. So, <laughs> what is Neil Magny's best performance? Lombard? Yeah, that's like the big yeah, one, I think. I think so. Right? Lombard beat fight. the soul out of him in the first round. See, mm-hmm. I, and then I, just went, fell I, I would say that that's his most memorable performance, but I don't think that's actually his best performance. That's I honestly think his best performance oh, was, I, was his last his fight against D Rod. That was great. I think his I think his the leech fight was really great because he came off from that two year layoff and just like Lee had yeah, that's a great him. one. Like Neil Magny, one. Neil Magny threw a perfect game against Lee Giuliano. He did, yeah. that's where the one where Lee literally turned around to like get away. And Neil Magny just like his with his long arms just like looped a hook and punched Lee in the front of the face <laughs> from behind him. It was a great, it was a great moment. Yeah, look at these, I, look at these wins. I, I, still but, go D, I still go D Rod because that he was, he was the first person to ever finish D Rod. Sure. Um, yeah. I was picking D Rod actually pretty confidently to beat Magny, so I was like, whoa, I'm dumb. So uh, I, right. I, in a weird way, like uh, it'll be, it'll be very. There's too many ifs, but like if Magni, if somehow Magni is doing this kind of almost Gilbertus Share esque, like late career prime, I want to say I don't want to say resurgence, but a, a prime is is he? He might be this one of those weird guys that post 35 years old at welterweight. Maybe he's entering his prime. I don't believe it, but if he somehow dominates Gilbert Burns, who the freak knows? But um, it's, I, I, I like I it. It's going to, because if you look at Neil Magny's, like all of his big losses are to incredibly high level black belts, like Maya, RDA, Michael Chiesa, guys that don't let him do what Neil, Neil Magny does. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he got stopped by Santiago and Shafkat, Shafkat at him and, and Lorenz Larkin. He lost to Lorenz, but Neil Magny has admitted that he kind of definitely looked past Lorenz Larkin. And that's like Lorenz Larkin's best performance in yeah. the UFC. It, 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 he said the um, same thing about Shafkat too. I kind of, I yeah. just had too many things going on in my life to really concentrate on the fight, and that yeah. was a mistake. Maybe right. that's maybe he's just making excuses. Maybe that is true, but um, it is an interesting fight, and I I, I just felt like it, the fight needed a little bit more love from us. Mm-hmm. He uh, look at his wins on his Robbie Lawler, Carlos Condit, Johnny Hendricks, Lombard, Gaslam. He's got some. He's a, he's a Hall of Famer. That's a Hall of Fame resume. He has got, and he came from the Ultimate Fighter. I, I totally forgot about that. One of the worst seasons. The, the worst. worst season, without <laughs> question, terrible. the worst season. Terrible, terrible. T- talent wise and enter- and entertainment wise, and the coaches horrible, just horrible. Who won that year? Was that Colton Smith? He he. Oh, uh, Colton Smith. Was it only was it only a one division? I show? think it was. Yeah. Oh, that's bad. 
and uh, who did he beat? Mike Ricci is that? Mike am I Ricci, remembering this? Who, who, who like knocked out injury. Magny? Mike Ricci KO'd oh. Magny. What a world! He was, a, he was another world great Canadian, Canadian hope for us. And 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 one thing too, really interesting. I right know Magny. He he could have easily been released after his two fight losing streak to Marias and Seth Pazinski, uh way back in 2013. Two, like two decisive losses, especially the Marias loss. I was at that fight. I remember yeah. we were actually, uh, who was I with? Um, Tom Kong Watson. And we ran into Magni on the beach the next day. He just got destroyed by Sergio Marias. And he basically thought he was done in the UFC. He thought like that was, he just, he was like, he was just like just super bummed and we we're just, i was just kind of there like hey man you know they, they were like these things happen you know and um and then he lost his next fight i can't believe he's still around and this high level in a in a, in the ufc at welterweight division it's 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 actually quite just the resilience that he had to to, to even be here still is pretty incredible yeah, rattled off uh, seven straight after the Pazinski loss. How about that? He can he can easily been dropped. That. He's been released, <laughs> you know. Wow. All right. Well, I think we've uh, I think we've done it. I think we have done it here. Um, we'll have more to talk about. That's for sure. Tomorrow, four forty-five p.m. Eastern time. People's pre-fight show. Join us. Your questions the entire time till the first fight starts. Uh, then we're going to have the watch party, ladies and gentlemen. Watch party, 9.45 p.m. Eastern. Jose is going to join the fun uh, to give his Moreno figgy <laughs> insights. Uh, New York Rick will join us. Drake Griggs will join us. So it should be a lot of fun. Myself at GC in the MAR studio. Post-fight coverage, all the fun stuff. And then AK and I are back live Sunday morning for another edition of On to the Next One. Some matchmaking. It's going to be a, a very busy weekend, and it's going to be a very busy year here in the sport of mixed martial arts. You can hit the music. We are done. And we appreciate y'all watching. We appreciate you listening. This has been a lot of fun. Get some sleep. One more rest. And then it's UFC 283 fight day. So for AK, for Casey, for Jose, I am Mike Heck. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you tomorrow, everybody.